here with us. If you have your Bibles, let's open to Luke chapter 16, verse 18. We're going to start there. We're going to, um, and if you have your handout, you see it on the page. There are several passages of Scripture we're going to be going to. The first one is Luke chapter 16, verse 18. We are still in our series, keeping it in context, keeping it in context. And uh, we have started off this series talking about divorce and remarriage. I was just sharing Facebook with the people here how behind the scenes people have been contacting me saying that this is really helpful to them. Thank you so much. That's why we are doing this series. It is to help people to operate in truth where, this, where, where different topics are concerned. Jesus said it is the truth that makes us free. And so when we operate in the truth of God's word, we experience freedom. But I always, I've always said, if the truth will make you free, error will put you in bondage. And so if we misinterpret God's word, we can end up in bondage. And where this topic of divorce and remarriage is concerned, as I have been studying it, looking at it, looking at what other people say, looking at the comment section of different YouTube videos of different pastors and teachers and theologians and scholars teaching on this, and I've looked at a lot of them, <laughs> I'm amazed at what I'm seeing and hearing, and I recognize that, man, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of things that are being said that's not accurate, and what really gets my heart is to see people who are listening to this and who feel like, okay, so then I'm being punished for something I didn't do, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Let's look at, uh, we're going to be talking today about Jesus teaching, we're going to start talking about Jesus' teaching on divorce. We've done two messages thus far, and we began looking at, first of all, the passage of Scripture that says in Malachi, does, where it says, I hate divorce. And we call that, does God hate divorce? Question mark. And we looked at that passage in its original Hebraic context, looked at it in its ancient Near Eastern context, looked at the Hebrew language, and find out that that passage of Scripture in English really is not translated correctly, and it's not really saying what we have made it to say. We then start looking at, is there only one ground for divorce? That was our last session. Does the Bible only teach one ground for divorce, which is adultery? And we said, actually, when you look at the biblical text, the biblical text actually teaches four grounds for divorce, which we're going to be looking at in a little bit. And we've been looking at that, looking at what we normally as Christians call the Old Testament, what we refer to here as the Torah, the Hebrew Scriptures, or the Tanakh, we're looking at what does the Bible actually say in its whole context. We're going to start looking at the words of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? So in Luke chapter 16, verse 18, it says this. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. This is one of the passages that has created problems for people. Let's look at another. Look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse 2. Mark chapter 10, verse 2. It says in Mark 10, verse 2, the Pharisees came and asked him, him being Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? He answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of, of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about this same matter. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. If a, if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Again, another passage that is difficult. These passages are sometimes, in certain books, uh, put under the heading, the difficult sayings of Jesus. And it, and it can be very difficult for people because basically... If you look at this, you go like, man, so if I, if I get divorced and I get remarried again, Jesus says I've committed adultery. And adultery is a sin. Therefore, he's saying, number one, well, I, I shouldn't get divorced. Or number two, if I get divorced, I should not get married again. 
Let's look at another passage, Matthew chapter 5. Let's go from Mark to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 31. Matthew 5, verse 31, Jesus here is saying in his famous Sermon on the Mount, Furthermore, <clears throat> excuse me, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes, now notice this, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. This even gets more difficult because Jesus says here, at least in our English translation, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery? And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Again, these are passages that have been very difficult. One more, and this is the one we're going to stop on, one we're going to start with and look at and dissect today. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to look at verse 3. Now, <clears throat> this verse here corresponds to Matthew chapter, uh, Mark chapter 10. Same situation, where the Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce, his, to divorce his wife for just, this is the New King James, for just any reason? He answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together... Let not man separate. Then they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And I'll read verse 10. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. <laughs> These passages and the controversy over the issue of divorce and remarriage among Christians has to do with Jesus' words here that we just read. Primarily. This is where the controversy starts. Based on these passages that we've just read, it is taught, number one, that Jesus taught against divorce. That's one of the things that that scholars and some pastors and teachers get out of this. Jesus taught against divorce. There are those who say, thus, he overthrew and he, or replaced the law of Moses with his own teachings. Because the law of Moses, the Torah, as we studied last week, did teach you could get divorced. And it also taught you could get remarried. There are those who look at what Jesus said and go, no, Jesus overturned that. He replaced it with his teaching. So there are those who say, because Jesus makes the statement, therefore what God has put together, let no man has put asunder, you can't get divorced at all. There are those who teach you can't get divorced at all for any reason, not even adultery. There are those who teach that, that Jesus taught you could divorce, but only in the case of a spouse who is unfaithful, a spouse who is committing adultery or sexual immorality. So there are those who say there is one reason for getting a divorce. There's only one and that is sexual immorality slash unfaithfulness slash adultery. But, it is t but there are those who taught you, even if for that reason, if your spouse commits adultery, you are free to get a divorce. However, you cannot remarry as long as your spouse is alive. We're going to be coming to some passages that deal with this in further, in further lessons. We're not going to cover everything because there's a lot to cover. And I looked at it and said, there's no way I'm going to cover this in one session, all that Jesus' teachings on this. Because we, then we've got to go into Paul, and we are going to go into Paul, his teaching on this. But there are those who teach that. If you divorce your spouse because your spouse has been unfaithful to you, and you want to remarry, you can't. You've got to wait until your spouse dies. If they die, you're free to remarry. If you remarry, there are those who teach. If you remarry while your spouse is alive, you have committed adultery. If you remarry while your spouse is alive, you've committed adultery. So the teaching is you are to remain unmarried as long as they are alive, and if possible, you're to seek rec reconciliation with your spouse. So if your spouse has been unfaithful, 
and you divorce your spouse or your spouse has been unfaithful and your spouse divorces you, you to remain unmarried as long as they are alive. If they die, you can marry. If, you, if they haven't died, you got to wait until they die. If they don't die, you should seek reconciliation. But you got to remain unmarried. And if they don't want to reconcile, what if they don't want to reconcile? There are people who face that. They, they don't want to reconcile. What's the teaching? You still must remain unmarried for the sake of Christ. Now, I've seen people ask this question, but wait a minute. What if I was divorced against my will? I didn't want the divorce. My sp spouse divorced me. I was trying to, I fought for the marriage. My spouse left. Then what? It is taught by some, you still must remain unmarried for the sake of Christ. Even if you are divorced against your will. Because again, if you remarry while your spouse is alive, it is taught you have committed adultery. Now, those who teach that, they're not trying to be mean. They're not, from what I've seen and read, I don't think they're trying to be mean. They're not trying to be insensitive, though at times I think they, there is some insensitivity going on. But they're trying to be faithful to the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, as they understand them. Just like people seek to be faithful to the words of Scripture that deal with women teaching in churches, you know, there's the question of, can a woman teach? Can a woman be in a position of authority? Yes, we're going to cover that. We're going to cover that passage that says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to use up authority over a man. We're going to teach on that, okay? And so there are those who, where that is concerned, believe no woman can have a position of authority within the church or no woman can teach another man. And what they're seeking to be is faithful to the biblical text as they understand it. Same way with the teachings of Jesus. People are seeking to be faithful to his teachings as they understand it. I can't fault people for that. However, like I said before, the truth will make you free. But error will put you in bondage. So we want to know as much as possible, what is Jesus saying here? Because as a result of this teaching and the way I've just laid it out, as I've heard people teach on and looked at what different pastors and scholars have said, as a result of this teaching, there are many people who have gotten divorced and as a result, they have and they are living a single lifestyle because they simply believe, I can't get married again. Even though they may desire to get married, even though they may have a desire to be and have someone in their life, they say, I just can't do it because the Bible teaches you cannot get married if you've been divorced because it's against the will of God and you have committed adultery if your spouse is still alive and you get married. So they believe that because they got a divorce, they can't get married, even if it was against their will or, be, or even if it was because of abuse or even, uh, com, even if there was adultery committed by their spouse. In some segments of the church, there are, pe there are people who, who say spousal abuse not a cause for adultery. They'll say it's a cause for separation, but not a cause for adultery. Now, in the session that we covered on the four grounds of abuse, we saw that from the, on the basis of the Torah, within, first, within ancient Judaism, first century Judaism, divorce on the basis of abuse was considered biblical. The Jewish people taught, they believe that. If you abuse your, abuse your spouse, man or woman, that's a cause for divorce. And we looked at that. But there are people who remain single. Some people remain si uh, single. And they seek to be happy. They seek to be joyful because they're seeking to obey God. They, they're seeking to obey what they believe is the will of God. So they say, okay, well, if that's my lot in life. And I've seen people on, on YouTube, and I've read their comments. They say, you know what? If this is my lot in life, I'm going to submit to the God's will, and I'll just remain single for the rest of my life. And I pray that Christ will give me the grace and the sufficiency to do so. I thought, that's commendable. But then there are those that I've read who are single, lonely, and miserable. And they feel like, why am I being punished for what I didn't do? I didn't want the divorce. My spouse initiated the, the divorce. I was faithful. My spouse cheated. I was faithful. My spouse was the one addicted to drugs and spending all of our money and running out on me. Why do I have to suffer for what? And the, people have said, this seems so unfair. Where the insensitivity comes in for me when I've heard people say things like, well, but that's the will of God. And you got to take it up with Jesus. And I'm going like, or maybe we need to re-examine our interpretation of the text. Now, understand me very clearly. 
for those of you who are here who know me, you know I'm committed to the biblical text. You know I'm committed to what does the text say? It's not first and foremost, well, how do I feel about it? No, what does the text say? Which will inform me how I should feel about it. <laughs> but what does the text say? However, that doesn't mean we should be insensitive to people. There's a passage of scripture in the Bible where it talks about where Jesus, there was a man, I think he had a withered hand or something, and the Bible says that they, they, Jesus was all these people and some of there were some Pharisees there and religious leaders. And Jesus asked the question, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath to heal or not? And it says that they were all watching him wanting to see what was he going to do? Is he going to heal? Is he gonna, which according to their theology, it will violate the Sabbath. And it says they look, Jesus looked around. Nobody would answer here. And the Bible says Jesus looked upon them with anger because they were insensitive to the plight of that man and were only concerned with, are, are you doing it on the wrong day? Jesus wasn't against the Sabbath. Jesus never violated the Sabbath. But wrong interpretation. Remember the woman who was bowed over with a spirit of infirmity? Jesus again said, which of you having an ox, if he falls into the, in the ditch on the Sabbath, you won't, pull, will you, won't you pull him out? Should not this daughter... Should not this woman who's a daughter of Abraham, who's been in this condition all this long, should she not be released? And so Jesus heals her, and later on we read that people rejoice, but there was one religious leader in the group who got upset. The Bible says he was indignant, he was mad. The power of God is being manifested right before him, and he's angry. And he says, six days should a man heal. On the Sabbath, you don't heal. Come on the other six days and heal. He completely doesn't see because of how he's interpreting the text. And as I said last week, one of the things I think we have to keep in mind, not that we bend the Bible to make it fit our needs and our desires, but we have to remember something. Like Jesus said about the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God gave his word to promote life, not death. So we have to look at and go, hey, is what we're teaching promoting life or death? Case in point, the rabbis of Israel at one point taught that in times of war, when it was the Sabbath, Israel could not take up arms against their enemies. It was a day of rest. You're to do no work. Guess what happened? The enemy would come in and kill them. So the rabbis got together and said, we need to rethink our interpretation of this because we're getting slaughtered. And so what was the interpretation? That the, that the Torah was given for life. God said you should do these things to live. So the rabbi says, God says we're to, do, we're to live by these, not die by them. And so they changed it. Next time the enemy came, Israel was ready. The point, though, is they recognize this is not leading to life. This is leading to death. And we need to reevaluate how we are interpreting the text. And so when it comes to people's lives, I speak from a standpoint of someone who seeks to be scholarly in their study of Scripture, but also with a pastor's heart. There's a pastoral concern that I have. So the two are wedded together to say, hey, if people emotionally are dying because of what we're teaching, maybe we need to reevaluate this. So that's where this is coming from. So, what is Jesus dealing with in this passage? Now, many people will say, well, look, Mike, 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 this Jesus is, is really is plain and it's simple. It's, it's, it's simple what Jesus is saying. Just read it. Take it for what it is. But I ask the question, is it really that simple? Is it? Are we considering the historical and the cultural and the linguistic context of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not a 21st century Protestant evangelical speaking in English from Chino, California. <laughs> Jesus is a first century Jew communicating in Semitic language, communicating as a rabbi to other rabbis. And are we catching the nuances of what he's saying? What I want to suggest to you from what I've studied thus far, for the most part, we have missed. I'm talking about the church and its teachings on this. We have missed what Jesus said. And that, as a result, has put people in bondage. And it's not because people are malicious. 
is because we were ignorant, meaning we didn't know. So what is the historical and cultural context? We need to talk about, remember, we keep it in, in context, deals with the historical, the cultural, the linguistic context, as well as the liter literary context of topics that we are dealing with. First of all, Matthew's version of this teaching gives us a great view and insight into Jesus' words. As we said before in our last session, in our last lesson, the Torah gives four grounds from divorce, for divorce, four grounds for, divor for divorce based on Exodus chapter 21, verses 10 and 11, and Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. The four grounds for divorce within Judaism that was accepted by all Jews within the first century. No rabbi, no Jewish person had a problem with these four reasons. Number one was sexual immorality or unfaithfulness committed by your spouse. That was one grounds for divorce. Number two, not providing food for your spouse. Number three, not providing clothing for one's spouse. And then number four, withholding sexual intimacy or love from one's spouse. So neglect in these three areas plus spiritual, uh, not spiritual, but plus uh, sexual immorality were grounds for divorce by both men and women. So if a man did not provide for his wife, and by not providing for his wife, we don't mean that, you know, it was a bad turn in the economy or the cops, crops didn't grow that, that well, and he, had, he was having a hard time. So like, you're not providing for me. I'm out of here. Bye. Wasn't that. It was that he refused to give her what she needed. Or if she refused to get through, because these were part, remember we said last time, these were part of the marriage vows. When, is, when Israelites would get married, these were included in their ketubah. This was included in their marriage contact, contract that they would do these things. I will provide, I will be faithful to you. I will provide for you clothing. I'll provide for you food. I'll provide for you love. These things were promised. So to not do these things was considered a violation of your marital vows. And if you continue to do it and you wouldn't repent, it was a basis for divorce. It was grounds for divorce if the spouse kept engaging in these wrong behaviors and refused to turn and repent. This was accepted by, any, by every Jew in the first century. But by the first century of Jesus' day, there was given and there came up a new ground for divorce by the first century. A new ground. This new ground of divorce replaced and actually made irrelevant the four grounds of divorce that was given in the Torah. This new ground of divorce was known as the any cause divorce. The any cause, C-A-U-S-E, or the any reason divorce. And this ground for divorce was actually based upon one of the passages We've looked at Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1. It's here in your handout where you can read it. It says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. Notice there I've highlighted or put in bold the words some uncleanness. In the first century, now this is a historical context. In the first century, there was a debate between two Jewish or rabbinic schools of thought, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. Hillel was a famous rabbi. Shammai was a famous rabbi. You see them over and over again talked about in rabbinical literature. They had their own schools, sometimes referred to as the house of Shammai, the house of, Sh of Hillel, but it's talking about their followers, their rabbinic schools. There was a debate between them. The debate was how to interpret the words in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, where it says, some uncleanness. How are these words to be interpreted? Remember, this is the first century. This is the time of Jesus. In some versions of our English Bibles, the word some uncleanness can actually be translated as something indecent or some indecency. The New Revised Standard actually translates it as because he finds something objectionable about her. So there was a debate among these two schools. How do we best translate and interpret these words? Because that's going to determine how we apply. Keep in mind that in Judaism, the interpretation of the text is for the application of the text. 
And so the way we interpret it is the way we're going to apply it. In Hebrew, the term some uncleanness or something indecent or some indecency, the Hebrew term, it's two words, ervat debar. Ervat debar. The word ervat means nakedness, what is uncovered, shameful, something is shameful because it's uncovered. It can mean indecent. Ervat refers to the nakedness of something. And the word debar means thing, a matter, or a cause or reason. A cause or reason. So li literally, ervat debar, it actually should be an A, not an E. Well, sometimes it's an E. But ervat debar can be translated as the nakedness of a thing, according to Joe Sprinkle and his biblical law and its, rel and its relevance. Ervat debar can be translated as the nakedness of a thing. Or it can be translated as a matter, debar, matter, a matter of indecency. A matter, a debar, of ervat, indecency. Or literally, it can be translated as indecency of a matter. This is how David Enstone Brewer in his book, Divorce and Remarriage, translates it. Literally, it can be translated as indecency of a matter. Now, here's the thing. Why is this so important? Because the, la the, the rabbis, you have to understand how the rabbis read the text. They read the text very carefully. One of, one of the, the guys who was a friend of mine, a scholar by the name of uh, Joseph Frankovic, great scholar, knew him a long time ago, haven't heard from him recently, but Joseph made a statement one time. He says, the rabbis are like blind men reading Braille. You know Braille? Little bumps on a page. They said the rabbis are like blind men reading Braille. And when they come across, they're sensitive to what's in the text. And when they come across something that doesn't seem right, they stop. And they go, wait, what's that? Why is that like that? It may be like, hey, you know what? Normally, uh, this word is spelled with one yod in the Bible. This is how well they know the text. It's spelled with one, the Hebrew letter yod, it's spelled with one yod, but in this here, the only place in the Bible is spelled with two yods. Now, we might read it and go, okay, so. <laughs> the rabbis want to know, why is it spelled with two yods? They're sensitive to that. Why, is, why does they have two yods? Why? And they just can't leave it alone. They've got to figure out why. So they're reading the text, and those of the school of Hillel looked at these two words together, ervat, Devar, and they say, why say ervat devar? I mean, we know ervat means indecency, and they had come to translate it by the first century. It meant sexual immorality. This is what the indecency had come to mean. It means indecency because it can mean to uncover the nakedness. That means someone is being un indecent. They are committing, committing sexual immorality, i.e. adultery. We're going to talk a little bit more about this word, next, I think, next week. Uh, so they said, why do we say ervat devar, a matter of indecency, when we know that ervat means indecently, it means sexual immorality, so why don't we just say ervat? Why do we got to say debar? Or why do we have to say debar ervat or ervat debar? Why do we have to say a matter or cause or reason of indecency? It should have been enough just to say because he finds in her ervat. He finds in her sexual immorality. Why these two words? All that needs to be said is he sees ervat. He sees indecency. He sees immorality. And they said the bar is actually superfluous. It's unnecessary. This is an unnecessary word. Why you got a word in there that's extra? Now, of course, actually, the rabbis, they don't think there is, and the rabbis actually say in, the, in their Jewish literature, there is nothing superfluous in the Torah. Everything is there for a reason. So you have to understand Jewish thinking. Everything in the Torah is for a reason, and we have to find out why it's there. So the rabbis pull apart this phrase, because again, there is nothing superfluous in the Torah. They said, debar, if, if it says, derbar, ervat debar, and we know that a bar means that it's something sexual, immoral, there's no need to say ervat, because that's kind of saying something redundant. So therefore, debar must refer to something else. And in Jewish thinking, they said, devar is a second ground for divorce. 
So we have here in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, according to the school of Hillel, remember there's two schools, Hillel and Shammai, according to the school of Hillel, there are two grounds for divorce in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. There is ervat, sexual immorality, but there is also debar, cause. Remember, debar means reason or cause. So the Hillelites concluded the Torah is teaching two grounds for divorce. You can get divorced because of sexual indecency or adultery. Everybody agreed with that. And the school of Hillel taught you can also get divorced for any reason, any cause. Because the bar can mean reason or cause. In other words, the rabbis from the school of Hillel would teach, the teachers would teach, the sages would teach, the husband can divorce his wife because she has lost favor in his eyes, either because of sexual immorality or for any reason. If she has lost favor in his eyes for any reason, he can get rid of her. He can get a divorce. Matter of fact, the school of Hillel once taught a man may divorce his wife even if she ruined a dish of food that she prepared for him. If she burns the toast, she's out of here. You burn my toast, I'm giving me another wife. This is what the school of Hillel basically taught. <laughs> now, just to say real quick, as you said, well, 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 he burns the toast. By the first century, a woman could divorce for Ervat. Debar, she could divorce for Debar, any cause. Rabbi Akiva, who was an early second century rabbi right after the time of Jesus, he carried on this teaching and he taught, now ladies, y'all are not going to like Rabbi Akiva. Now, Rabbi Akiva says some good stuff. He also says some stuff like Akiva, no. He said, even if he finds someone more pretty than she is, he can divorce her. He's going along and he goes, you, you, you're not as skinny as you used to be when we got, you don't look as good. You don't, I'm just telling you. And he could, according to Rabbi Akiva, on the basis of the school of Hillel's interpretation of a Ravat Debar, any cause, in, Debar, any cause, you could divorce your wife even if you found someone prettier. Any reason. Any cause. I just don't want to be with you no more. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like you or your mama. I'm getting out <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, by the first century, this was accepted by Jesus' day. This was accepted. This, was a, this became the common ground for divorce. You didn't need the four other ver reasons anymore. You've got any cause. Or today we call it no-fault divorce. There's no fault. You, you, you want a divorce? It's done. No fault. They had it in the first century in Judaism. It was an any cause divorce. Now, the school of Shammai opposed this interpretation. They went, uh-uh, no, no. They taught that a matter of indecency in Ervat Debar applies only to adultery or sexual immorality. They accepted all of the other three. You know, if, if, a, if a spouse neglects food, clothing, love, and, and adultery, those four, they said, these are the reasons for divorce. But this any cause, the school of Shammai said, no, we don't accept this. So they did not accept that you could get divorced for any cause. They did not accept if you find someone who's prettier than your current spouse or more handsome or better looking or got more money that you can divorce. They did not accept this. They were against it. They only accepted the four grounds for divorce. In Jesus' day, the any cause interpretation was the common, most popular reason, and it was the most used ground for divorce. According to David N. Stone Brewer, Brad Young, David Biven, who are scholars, this was the most common and most popular reason for divorcing. And matter of fact, by the second century, after the time of Jesus, by the second century, the school of Hillel, their opinion won the day. And people were following the rulings of the school of Hillel. So in the second century, this was, the, this was it. This is how you could, you could divorce for any reason. That, that it ruled the day. So that's the historical background. So what was Jesus? Now see, this is important to understand when the, when the Pharisees are coming to Jesus. What are they doing? And we've got to keep in mind, these are 
Pharisees. These are teachers of the law. These are, they, they would be called rabbis. Now, they were not, rabbi was not a formal term like it is today, but it was a title of respect. So when they called Jesus rabbi, they were respecting him as a teacher of the Torah. For them to come and say and ask him about this, they, that meant that they respected him. They respected his skill, his expertise in the Torah. They knew Jesus had it going on. So what's going on when they come to him? What is Jesus dealing with? Go back to Matthew chapter 19 again. Look at verse 3. Then the Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and said to him, now notice this, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? What are they asking him about? They are not asking Jesus, is it lawful to divorce? That's not what they're asking him. Because the, everybody knew, according to the Torah, it is lawful to divorce. What they're asking him is this teaching, ervat devar, matter of indecency. We have a school, Hillel, that says it can be done for any reason. What do they ask him? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Jesus, we want to know what you're teaching on this. You're a rabbi. We respect you. We know what Hillel says. We know what Shammai says. What do you say? They're asking him, if we were to put it in today's language, they're asking him, what's your ruling on this passage? What is your halakha, your legal ruling? Well, how do you interpret this passage, Jesus? They're not asking him, is it lawful to divorce? They're not even asking him, is it okay to be remarried? That's not the question. The question is, is it lawful to divorce your wife for any reason? In other words, Jesus, we want to ask you about the any cause divorce. Is this according to the Torah or not? Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever heard this? About the any cause divorce? And it, This is what I'm saying. We have missed this. We have not paid attention to the text. We're thinking, oh, they're asking Jesus, is it okay to divorce? That's not what they're asking him. Is it okay to be remarried? That's not what they're asking him. They're asking him one question. We want to know, what do you say about any cause divorce? What do you teach? We know what Hillel teaches. We know what Shammai teach. What do you teach? They were asking about his opinion of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Understand that with a first century Jewish context, this is normal. To go to a rabbi and say, what do you teach on this? What's your opinion? This is a normal thing to do. This is why I say we've got to keep it in context. What's the historical context? What's the cultural context? Culturally, it was normal to go to a rabbi and go, what's your teaching on this text? We've got these various schools. And by the way, sometimes when I hear people teach on this, and this is where all, all of us have got to be careful. Kind of like what you and I were talking about earlier about going on Wikipedia and reading stuff. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful when you go online and people say this. Well, see, the Jewish people taught that you could get, uh, the Jewish rabbis taught you could get divorced for any reason. Not all Jewish rabbis taught this. The school of Shammai did not teach this. So I heard a very well-known pastor say this the other day. He said, well, see, the Jewish people taught. Not, I thought, that's wrong. Not all, that's misleading. That's not keeping it in its context. Not all, there was no one unified Jewish thinking about anything in the first century. Some people will say, the Jewish people did not believe that you could heal on the Sabbath. No, there were certain Jewish people who believed you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. Not everybody. Even to this day, depending on what it is, the rabbis will tell you, well, if you want to know about how this custom should be handled or how you should, you need to go talk to the rabbi in your area because his ruling might be different from my ruling on certain issues. In the first century, Judaism was not what we could call monolithic. It was not like they got all these set of beliefs all set down in stone, and this is what everybody believed. That's not the way it was. As a matter of fact, scholars today have even said, maybe we shouldn't talk about first century Judaism. Maybe we should talk about first century Judaisms. Because there's a lot of different beliefs. There was a lot of different ideas that were floating around. So the idea that Jews or rabbis of the first century taught this 
is not 100% true. Even I have to be careful of that sometimes. Go, well, this is what the Jewish people believe. Well, certain Jewish people believe that. There are certain things that they all held to, like the Torah is the will of God. Okay, they, everybody held to that. Israel was God's people. Everybody held to that. Yeah, there are certain things that they all held to. But then there are certain things in terms of interpretation of the text that there was various interpretations about it, how you should look at a text. So they're asking Jesus about his teaching concerning this debate. They're asking him to enter into the debate and to give his teaching on it. They're saying, Jesus, does Ervat Debar refer only to adultery, or does it also teach, as Hillel says, that you can divorce for any reason or any cause? So what Jesus was doing here in Matthew chapter 19, what he's doing in Mark chapter 10, what he is doing in Luke chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 5, he is referring to and he is refuting one particular Jewish teaching by one school that was popular at the time that you could divorce your spouse for any reason. He's refuting that. Jesus is answering and he's basically saying, if you divorce except for sexual immorality, you are committing adultery. What's the background to this? He is saying, in other words, no. Deuteronomy 24.1 and Ervat Debar does not teach that you can divorce for any cause or for any reason. This is a misinterpretation of the Torah. This is a destroying of the Torah. This is what Jesus is saying. If you're teaching people that they can get div divorced for any reason, guy walks down the street, he sees a woman who's prettier than his wife, or a or, or wife sees a guy, and she's like, he looks like he's doing better financially than my husband, I'm out of here. Jesus said, if you endorse that, that is a misinterpretation of the text. This is where Jesus says things like, you, through your commandments, are making the word of God of none effect. Through your interpretation, you are, deri you are depriving the word of God, the Torah, the will of my Father, of its authority. He is teaching against a way of thinking about the text that people had embraced. So he is saying, no, you cannot divorce for any reason. He is not saying you cannot divorce. Nor is he saying, and we're going to get into this more because it's going to take some time to unpack it. He is not saying you cannot remarry. First of all, that wasn't the question. Second, everybody knew you could divorce and everyone knew you could remarry. He said, but why does he say things like, well, if you divorce and you marry somebody else, you commit adultery. We're going to come to that. Stay with me. It takes time to unpack all of this. It takes time. We're going to, I'm doing it little by little in building. Number one, so I don't confuse you with a bunch of information. And so that when you get to you're like, oh, okay, this makes perfect sense. This is this, this, so Jesus is saying you are misinterpreting the Torah. This is what he's teaching. He's teaching the same thing in Matthew chapter 5. Go over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is why important. This is why we really do need to become sensitive to the text like the rabbis. We need to become like people reading Braille. Because for years, I read it too. Where the, the, the Pharisees said, is it, is it lawful for a man to divorce for any reason? I just skipped over that. And thought, there's only one reason Jesus gave for divorce. And that's adultery. Now, I would say, well, if your husband or your spouse, your wife is beating you, you may want to get out of there too. But then there are those who, again, who say, no, nope, only adultery. I've heard people say it, only adultery. No other reason is valid. You got to stay in the relationship, or if you separate, you got to stay separated, hope for reconciliation. And again, let me say this. I want to say this because I want to make clear. I am not advocating for divorce. I'm not here teaching saying, hey, go get divorced. <laughs> it's okay. God's cool with it. God's not cool with it. When it is for the wrong reasons, as we're going to see more and more and more and more and more. What Jesus states, and again, we're going to look at this in more detail. God's ideal is for people to stay together. That's why, he, that's why Jesus, well, that's why Jesus in Matthew 19, he says, listen, in the beginning, he made them male and female. And that's why he said, that was his, that was his ideal. He made them male and female. He brought them together. The two shall be one. That is God's desire. However, God allowed. Now, it says Moses allowed, but like we said last week, in Jewish thought, to say Moses permitted you, it was to say God permitted you. Because the Torah came from God through Moses. God gave Moses the Torah. He said, but God permitted divorce because of hardness of heart. We're going to talk about what that means in its context. 
He's not saying if you get a divorce. Let me let me back up. He's not saying. If you are any way victimized by someone, by your partner in the relationship, you're being abused emotionally, physically, financially. And you decide, I can't take this anymore. I need to get out. Jesus is not saying you have a hard heart. He is not accusing the victim of having a hard heart. Because there are people who have read it that way. Well, you know why people get divorced? Why? Because they have hard hearts. Yes, people get divorced because they have hard hearts, but we have to understand what hard heart means in its context and to whom is that being applied? To whom is Jesus speaking? He's not speaking of the victim. He's not speaking of someone whose husband, or, or let me rephrase that, whose spouse is repeatedly committing adultery. He's not speaking to someone whose spouse has refused to meet their needs spiritually and mentally and emotionally and physically. And he's not saying, well, if your spouse refused to meet your needs and you opt out, it's because you have a hard heart. We all got hard hearts. People like to say, well, you know, we're all sinners. Yes, we're all sinners, but that's not what he's talking about in context. That's not the context. And so the reason I say this is because people have needlessly been made to feel guilty because they had to get out of a marriage where they were truly, I'm going to use this word, and people say, oh, you, nobody's really, they were truly innocent, meaning, meaning they were not doing something to cause the deterioration of their marriage. They were trying to save the marriage. They were trying to keep it going. But things were, or it was just so bad, they said, I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. And I've, I have talked to people and worked with people. Now, some people I've been able to work with, and we've been able to help save their marriage. Some people, we've not been able to do that. Some people had hard hearts. I've worked with guys, or, or couples, where I should say, I've worked with couples where one person in the relationship decided, I don't want to work on this marriage anymore. I'm out. And I could start to tell by the way they were, they were showing up late for the sessions, they weren't doing the homework assignments, and I was like, and they've already checked out. And I would talk to them about it. And then all of a sudden, next session, they didn't show up at all. And then they would send a note through the other spouse saying, I'm not coming back anymore. Yeah, I know, because I was thinking, that's so cowardly. <laughs> or, and, or they wouldn't return my phone calls, wouldn't return my text, and they end up getting divorced. Hard heart. But we're going to talk about what the hard heart is. Okay? So, my point in this, again, is not to advocate for divorce in the sense of, yeah, I'm rooting for divorce. Everybody in here who knows me knows I do my best. I bust my behind to try to help people stay married. I, I help people. I do everything I can do, teach them everything I know to help people stay married. However, even God recognizes because of people's hearts, sometimes, as much as I don't want it to happen, it needs to happen. So Jesus is also teaching about this any cause and it not being biblical in Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 31. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, now notice this, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality. Notice that. Whoever divorces for any reason except sexual immorality Sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. Whoever marries a woman who is divorced in this manner commits adultery. We're going to come back to that last section. We're going to talk about what that means in, the, in our next lessons. But notice here, it's in, Jesus here is implying, if you are getting a divorce based upon any reason, based upon any cause, you are violating the word of God. Now this, Jesus here is teaching the sermon, he's teaching this in the midst of the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Remember what Jesus said he was doing on the Sermon, of the, on the sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He said, I have not come to destroy the Torah. I have come to fulfill the Torah. Remember I shared with you early on when we start talking about Jewish roots. To destroy the law is a Jewish rabbinic technical term, which means to misinterpret the Torah. And to misinterpret it in such a way that you cause other people to disobey it. 
to fulfill the Torah is to rightly interpret the word of God, to bring out its full meaning in order to, in, in to cause people to obey it, to more fully obey it, to more, ful, to, to more fully obey and fulfill God's will. That's what it means to uh, uh, come to fulfill. These are rabbinic terms. These were well-known terms. So Jesus is teaching on the Torah. He is bringing out the real full, I should, I should say the real, he's bringing out the full, complete intention of what God is communicating in the text. So he says, listen, and we're going to have to go into this in more detail, but he says, listen, you've heard that it was said, you should not kill. But I say unto you, and it should be more accurately, and I say unto you, which is a rabbinic formulation, you've heard that it was said, you won't, don't kill. And I say unto you, now I'm going to give you my interpretation, which is going to bring out more fully the text so you can more fully obey, thou shalt not kill. If you're angry with your brother without cause, you will, you've murdered already in your heart. So what's his point? Deal with the heart, and you will never fulfill, or you won't violate, thou shalt not murder. But you've got to deal with what's in the heart first. It's not just about the outward commandment, it's about what's in your heart. You've heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Let me tell you what my father was really getting at. If you look at a person and you lust after them and you desire them in your heart, you've already committed adultery with them. So what's Jesus saying? Deal with what's in your heart. You will never get to adultery. Deal with what's in the heart. So you've heard it said, listen, Go back. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate. But I say to you, you've heard that it was said, and the implication here is, based off what he said, you've heard that it was said, you can divorce your wife for any reason. But I'm telling you, if you divorce your wife for any reason, other than the one that God has given, you're in sin. He is bringing out the full meaning and correct interpretation of the text. He says, people have been destroyed. If you look, the only, the, the, Jesus, what he most gets upset with some of the Pharisees, not all of them, some of them, what he gets upset with is a misinterpretation of the text. He tells them, you are making the word of God of none effect through your traditions. You're teaching things that is depriving the word of God of its power and its authority over people's lives. And if people are not living by God's will, which he gave for life, that means they're moving in the direction of death. And you are responsible for it. So Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. How do you have life? People say, well, it's through Jesus. Yeah, what did Jesus say? The flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. The words I speak to you, the teachings I give you, they are spirit and life. He's not saying anything different than his heavenly father. I've set before you, God said, through Moses, life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. How? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. I've given you all these commandments. By choosing the commandments, you choose life. You choose my words, you choose life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. He also said, I've come not to destroy the Torah, but to fulfill the Torah. Why? Because if, you, if I am correctly interpreting the Torah, I'm leading you into the path of the life, which is God's original intent that you live, that you flourish, that you are blessed, but you've got to do it God's way. And trying to do it another way won't get you there. It will lead you into the path of death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So Jesus is teaching people what the Torah is actually teaching. And he is saying the Torah does not teach that you can divorce your wife or your spouse, your, your husband, for any reason. I don't like the way he looks at me. His breath stink in the morning. I don't like, <laughs> you know, he gained weight, she gained weight. Not, re not valid reasons for divorce. Not valid reason. Go over to Mark chapter 10. Does this make sense? 
Okay, let's close here. Mark chapter 10. Now we're going to be coming back to these and looking at these verses in more detail. Mark chapter 10, verse 1 through 12. We're going to start at verse 1. Then he arose from there, came to the region of Judea by the other side of Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again. And as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. Notice in verse 2, they leave out the words in Mark's version for any reason. It's not here. It's also not in Luke's version. But this is, the same con this is the same story that we read in Matthew. And he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. Jesus answered and said, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female for this reason. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. He's letting us know God's ideal. So then they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So let me say this. There are those who teach. See, Jesus said there is no reason for divorce. But context. What's the context of this? He's talking about Ervat Davar. He is saying, listen. Y'all are making it easy for people to get divorced. You're separating what God has put together by misinterpretation of the text. Because in the text, God does permit a divorce for hardness of heart, but not for any reason. Any reason basically is for the lust of the flesh. He said, I'm not, there is no divorce allowed for that. So quit making allowances for it, is what Jesus is saying. Don't make any allowance for the lust of the flesh. Verse 10, in the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same manner. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Again, we're going to cover this. This is what I want you to see. Mark's version does not have, and Luke's version does not have, the any reason clause like Matthew does. This has caused many, caused many people to misunderstand and misinterpret Jesus' words here. They'll say, well, see, there is no reason for divorce, but Jesus is still speaking about the any cause or any reason interpretation. According to Dr. Daniel, da uh, uh, David Instone Brewer, and this is the book, Divorce and Remarriage in the Bible, one of the things he talks about is that it was common for rabbis and or students to abbreviate teachings that had been passed on to them. They would abbreviate it. This is what he said, this is on your handout. Quote, the aim of abbreviation was to produce an account that was easier to remember. Therefore, the account was made shorter in such a way that what remained would remind the scholar of what had been omitted. This is why it's important to know culture. What's the culture of passing on tradition? What is the culture of passing on teachings by other rabbis? You abbreviate what's said to make it easier to remember. But what is, but what is left, the purpose of what, of, of what is left is to remind the scholar, the student, the teacher of what's been left out. You see, in Jesus' day, you taught primarily it was an oral culture. It was not what we would call a text literate culture. They did not so much rely upon writings. People could write, people could read, not very many, but people could write and read, but they would speak and people would listen. So what was of great use and purpose was memory. People would memorize what their teachers said. They would memorize what their teachers had taught. It was an oral culture and an oral culture. This is why the book of James, as I've said before, does not say, but be doers of the word and not readers only. James doesn't say that. James says what? But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? It's an oral culture. We are a text culture. We go by the written word. We have the written word. We write stuff down. We, we, we are an iPhone culture. How many of you, how many of you got at least 25 numbers in your iPhone or your, your phone? At least 25. How many, of you, how many of them you got memorized? 
Remember before we had iPhones? You had to memorize all them numbers? <laughs> if you ask me right now, what's your wife's number? I couldn't tell you. I'd be like, let me get my phone, let me check. <laughs> because we've become an iPhone text culture. We depend upon our iPhone. But when I was growing up, and a lot of them, you can remember, we had numbers, mem- I mean, you would write them down, but you had numbers memorized. We would memorize it. That's because we, did, we didn't, didn't have a phone you could pull out. You might have a booklet, but most of the key numbers you needed to know, you knew those numbers, right? In Jesus' day, they would memorize material, but they would use abbreviation. They had all different type of tricks that they would utilize in order to retain the material. So they would abbreviate. Understand that the Gospels that we were, are reading were first orally spoken before they were written down. It was traditions that were passed, upon, passed along. Yes, they would write them down, but this is why, by the way, when you read the Gospels, you ever notice sometimes, wait a minute, why is this story here? Because in Mark's Gospel, it's over here, and why does Mark's Gospel read differently? In ancient culture, they were not, what was important to them was to convey the intent, not necessarily accurate word for word. This is how it caused people to say, well, see, the Gospels are not reliable because Mark has Jesus say this here and Luke has him say it over here, so that's not reliable. You're judging ancient material based upon 21st century criteria, not upon how they did the criteria in the ancient world. This is why I say context, context, context. And so Luke, if you look at Luke's writings about marriage and divorce, the one we just read, it's in a completely different place. But it was common for a teacher or a student, it was common for a student to rearrange his teacher's material in order to make a point. Nobody would have looked at that and go, that's not when Jesus said that. Because that, that wasn't the point. And so we read in Mark, we don't see the any clause, we don't see the any cause clause, we don't see it in Luke because they are abbreviating. But it would have been understood, and I understand the Jewish people of that time would have understood this. In the Jerusalem Talmud, we have an example of an abbreviated teaching. The school of Shammai says, a man should not divorce his wife except if he found indecency in her. So let me ask you a question. Based upon this, what does the school of Shammai say? That a man should not divorce his wife except for what? He found indecency in her, right? Is that all Shammai taught about divorce? No. There's three other things that Shammai taught about divorce. But here we have the abbreviated version. The abbreviated version doesn't mean all that there is. The abbreviated version also is to call to mind something that's not spoken. It's implicit. Let me ask you a question. Can teenagers drink here in Southern California? Can teenagers drink? Yes or no? Huh? Now, I said, can you teenage? Some of you are like, and Cody actually asked a good question. Drink what? But it was also correct. Cheryl said he's talking about alcohol. All I said was, can a teenager drink? So when I said teenagers drink, Cheryl, what did your mind supply? Alcohol. Therefore, the answer would be no. But I could come back and say, well, they could drink water. Right? But there's, it's implied, because even though Cheryl knows they can't drink alcohol, she would accept, but they can drink water. In other words, I abbreviate it. And in abbreviating, you fill in the rest. It's dangerous if you're untrained. It's dangerous if you don't understand first century Jewish ways of teaching. So this is, and, and actually, Claudia makes a good point. She said, that's dangerous. This is what we've done with the text. We didn't have the right information to fill in. So we started filling in with our stuff. And that's dangerous, yes. <laughs> we start bringing to bear 20th century, 14th century, 4th century, 3rd century. But we didn't bring in, what's the 1st century understanding? How would they have heard this? What would they have filled it in with? So when Jesus says, listen, if you divorce your wife except for cause of adultery, everybody understood that's an abbreviated saying. We understand you can divorce your wife for four reasons. But what he is saying is this any cause thing, that doesn't fly. 
Does, he have, does Mark have to say this? No, because everybody understands the background. Can a teenager drive a car? Yes or no? So you're starting to fill it in. Can a teenager drive a car? How old is the teenager? Well, if the teenager is 17, they can drive. But even if they're 17, we've got to fill in more information. You've got to have a permit. You've got to have an adult in a car that's over, was it, 25? You have, a, you have to, yeah, who's, who's a licensed driver? Now, all I said was, can a teenager drive? We said, yes, if they're 16 and a half and 17 years old. But even with that, they have to have, but all I have to say is, can a teenager drive? And then you fill in the rest. If they're below 16 and a half, they can't drive. But I never said any of that. But if you know the background, you fill the rest in. The readers, the original audience of Jesus are Jews who know the background. And so when they make statements, just like here, we fill it in. The mistake that we've made is that we are Gentiles reading an English text 2,000 years removed from the original context. And we start filling it in with our stuff. Not that we're being malicious, but we have not understood that we have been ignorant. Ignorant meaning we didn't know. And to quote Mark Twain, and I'll end with this, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you think you know that ain't so that gets you in trouble. <laughs> and what has gotten us in trouble where this teaching is concerned on divorce and remarriage is what we in the West have thought we knew, and it wasn't so. So the idea, though, is to go back. We've got, this is why we're disciples. This is why we're students. This is why we take the time to unpack. This is why we take the time to learn, because there are little nuances there. Jesus is Jewish. Not only is he Jewish, he's a Jewish rabbi. And he was talking to other Jewish rabbis. And when they're talking, they're utilizing sophisticated language to communicate back and forth that we might miss. It's like if you listen to two engineers talk. You ever listen to two engineers talk? You ever listen to two quantum scientists talk? Quantum physicists? You don't understand a word of what they're saying because you don't know the language. So what Dr. Bean used to say to me about scholars, he said the problem with biblical scholars is that they write to other scholars. If you've ever read, I, I spent a lot of time reading scholarly words, scholarly papers, and they're talking about like, could you really, really, couldn't you have said that a little simpler? <laughs> You took 200 pages to say something you probably could have said in 40. But scholars write in a very technical way, in a very precise way. And I'm, I, I try to shorten it, but you see that I'm breaking things down. You don't see some of the stuff I'm reading. They get into prepositions and participles and everything, and you go like, well, why is that important? Now, personally, me, I get excited. I go, ooh, wow, that's subjunctive? How? Oh, wow. I go tell my wife that. She goes, and? <laughs> Really? Or she'll ask me a question about something. Karen's family. She'll ask me, she said, I need to ask you a question or something about the Bible. I go, okay. She goes, and I want the Twitter version, not Wikipedia. Because <laughs> she knows I'll start getting into it. Okay, see, she said, I don't need to know all the background. I said, no, 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 I can explain to you the back. No, you don't. Just tell me what it means. I don't need to know the Greek and the Hebrew, what the rabbi said, and what this first century Greco Roman order. No, I don't need to know all that. Just give me the Twitter version. 142 characters and less, or less. The point here is that we have to understand the background. That's why we're getting into culture and history and language and even literary, culture, literary context. That helps us to understand more what Jesus is saying. You learn anything today? Is this insightful? Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that we would better understand your will so that we can have life. I pray for those that are listening to this, Lord God, that they are, that, that one more shackle have fall, has fallen off. That they will know that because they had to get out of maybe a marriage, that was bad, Lord. That you were not condemning them, that they're not condemned, and that they're not shackled. Lord, as we explore this even more, our desire is to be conformed to your will, to conform to the image of your son, so that we can live in the freedom that you've purchased for us through Christ. 
Continue to teach us and instruct us, Father, in your way, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Facebook, thank you for joining us. Lord willing, we'll see you next week.